think technology can address some of the problems we come across in the world, create a more efficient way of doing things, and also a safer way. I think robots play a big part in that. So we have these blocks. Where would I go if I want to tell Root to draw? Shivana, do you remember? Oh yeah, I think it's in commands. Exactly. So Humans are innately curious and they want to figure out how the world works around them or how to solve a problem. I think robots are on that continuum of innovation. There are just so many different forms and shapes that robots can take. They can help in almost any industry. So the AD Make Beast Company was started in the mid-1800s. It quickly became the largest cranberry company in the world and was still the largest cranberry company in the world today. We make parts for medical, aerospace, military, automotive. The previous process that we had, it was like being glued to that machine for eight hours to make a certain amount of parts. I'll eat these all day long. Normally we'd have to walk out there, grab a square foot of vine, count your blossoms, kind of get an idea of what your crop is going to be. To have the drones be able to do that, that's all automatic. Being able to look at damaged spots, being able to watch temperatures, being able to watch moisture, all those things will make it easier to get your job done. With the robotic machine, it gives me that time back to do something that's more productive for me or more productive for the company. A robot is an extension of human capability, whether it's extending the capability to be more efficient, to measure things in uh, more precise manners, or extending the capability to explore the world. All right, engaging in three, two, one. You will see everything from drones to self-driving vehicles, walking robots, and we're excited that it's being developed here in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is an ideal location for a robotics company to get established and succeed. Because we have such a diverse group of people, we're able to think in different ways and tackle challenges. We have the breadth of talent. We have the investor community. There are manufacturers here that understand the hardware. We have the facilities to design it, fabricate it, and then take it out in the field and use it in our operations. All of that supporting infrastructure is here, as well as a very open environment for the technology. They know drones, we know cranberries. It's trying, trying to get those two get information those together, together to figure out what is the best. It's humans it's working humans side, work by side by side with robots. robots. It's very exciting. This feels like it's the future. Like and it's all here it's in Massachusetts. So as you just uh, saw, Massachusetts is truly a global leader when it comes to robotics. There are so many opportunities in the field and we need talented students and engineers and other uh, folks involved in the industry to really help it grow and thrive here in Massachusetts. So now I'd like to introduce you to uh, Helen Greiner. Welcome, Helen. Um, I used to work with Helen at iRobot, so I know some of her journey. And, uh, but I'm sure the viewers would be interested to learn a little bit about how you got started and, and your thoughts about the future of robotics. And I thought the best way to do that is let's get a student from the Boston Public Schools to, to ask the questions and interview you. So I'd like to introduce you to Elizabeth Garcia. Uh, Elizabeth is a uh, Boston Public School student who will be interviewing Helen. Um, by the way, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, during this period, uh, please feel free to do so. There is a questions tab on the right hand side. So if you just click on questions, type in your question. If we have uh, a chance, we'll we'll get to that. And if not, we'll we'll try to answer that uh, later on, maybe uh, post that on our website. So Elizabeth, uh, take it away. Program. Drone camp. Um, I am interested in technology and oceanology and psychology, but uh, enough about me. Let's get on to Helen. How are you doing today, Helen? Hi, it's great to be here today. Um, so for my first question, uh, I want to ask, 
How did you decide to get into robotics? Were there any robots from your childhood that really influenced you or any people? Yeah, you're right. I was inspired by a robot. And in 1977, I saw Star Wars on the big screen and I was enthralled with R2-D2 because he had an agenda, he um, was a motive, he, um, he was really one of the main characters and he was really more than a machine. And I was like, oh, I wish we could build things that were more than machines. Then, um, you know, I, I think I've got some of that. Um, we haven't built anything that saves the universe yet, <laughs> um, but at iRobot, we built the Roomba vacuuming robot. And when it goes around, it has these bleeps and bloops, and um, it starts to have a personality and a character. And people actually name them. They buy them as appliances, but when they get them home, the only thing they've experienced like it is an animal and they start to name them. So we get a little bit like there with that. We also, uh, next slide please, oh, uh, with the pack bot, um, but we also built at iVo, but it was an explosive ordnance disposal robot. And, um, you know, it would go out to bombs uh, before, instead of sending a soldier up to them. And uh, instead of having a soldier potentially blown up, the robot would take the danger. So um, again, we haven't saved the universe, but I think I've been able to get to some of my dream of building, um, things that are more than machines. That's really cool. Um, for our next question, where did you go to school and how did you decide what to study or what your major was gonna be? Well, um, something attracted me to MIT, which is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and I couldn't really decide between mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. So I did some of both. And then um, my undergraduate degree is in mechanical with a lot of electrical engineering courses. And my graduate work is in um, electrical engineering and computer science. Um, while you were at school, did you do anything else or like any other like programs? Did you find interest in anything other subjects? Um, yes, um, one of the most useful classes I had was actually um, technical writing. <laughs> it turns out the technical writing, convincing people of your arguments is really important. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, courses in uh, economics and I, I actually took Japanese because, um, well, they're big into robots in Japan as well. <laughs> um, uh, I played ice hockey for the MIT Women's Club as well, but I'm not sure I can get a robot connection though. <laughs> um, and next question, what was your first robot you built and how old were you? Um, well, unless you count a typewriter that I disassembled when I was eight to try and build a robot. Um, <laughs> uh, it's not a robot, but my dad had a TRS-80, one of the first home computers when I was a kid. And um, I learned how to program it to make computer games, which was kind of fun, right? It had a tape deck which you could control because there was that's how we stored programs way back in the olden days <laughs> um but that showed me kind of a connection between the physical and the computers and i knew i'd have to i i, I figured out that i have to study computers in order to make robots uh, this was very early days for robots obviously um now you probably go get a raspberry pi program it and put it it's an embedded uh controller you can put right on a robot and program it or just buy a robot kit um you could try Adafruit Industries to get all the components you need to design your own robot. But one thing I really recommend is um, joining a robot club, uh, Botball or First Robotics, um, because learning is really easier in a community and it's it, it's a lot more fun, right? Mm -hmm. um, so something that I'm actually really curious about, because uh, it's something I also kind of uh, go back and forth on, were you ever thinking about other careers? Um, well, before Star Wars, I, I think I wanted to be a pioneer like Laura Ingalls I don't, from Little House in the Prairie. <laughs> but I think that um, it turns out pioneering uh, technology is a lot better career option these days anyway. <laughs> um, how hard is it to start a robotics company and what were some of the challenges you see? Well, I think the biggest challenge is probably finding that product market fit because um, you can build the coolest thing, but it might not be practical, it might not be manufacturable, it might not be affordable. Uh, in fact, it usually isn't. <laughs> um, so to find that fit where you can make it at the cost a customer's willing to pay for it is, is quite tough. And at the beginning of iRobot, we really 
didn't know this. We were basically kids out of grad school, right? Um, well, we, we, we were building robots and we were marketing them to people we knew at research labs around the world, uh, but it didn't have a large market and they were, you know, thousands of dollars. So they, they weren't, didn't really have a great price point. Um, so don't do this, it really takes too long. Instead, you find an area where the robots can be really useful and learn everything about that area. Um, make contacts, talk to the customers. Um, and if you have an idea, a great idea, I think you'll find people in the industry even willing to, to help you. Um, you may raise capital, you may not, but a lot can be done through what they call guerrilla um, marketing, uh, doing a Kickstarter, um, getting the press to write about you, uh, or just going good old door to door and you know um, convincing people to buy your product. And I think that's um, that, that's a it, it's sometimes the best way to get going because you learn more about what you're really going to build um, before you uh, you know b before you go out and potentially raise a lot of capital. Okay, <laughs> that's really interesting. Um, do you think? Um... Do you think there was like a specific person you talked to or um, group you got acquainted with that really pushed iRobot into like what it is today? Um, iRobot's pretty dedicated to home robotics today. I think the work we did in the toy industry really helped out. We were working with Hasbro on toys and games and that really knocked it into our heads what, <laughs> what price point really meant because uh, toys, you really have to get very, very cost effective and you have to be um, really looking at the exact cost of each component and um, cutting out any features that are not absolutely uh, necessary, um, or at least leaving them as options. And um, really having that experience, bringing a toy to market with Hasbro, it wasn't successful. We put our hearts and souls into it. It wasn't successful, which is why, you know, you don't want to look at things that fail as failures, you, they're really stepping stones to your success. So, um, you know, we were crushed when it didn't do well on the market. I mean, some people said it looked like Chucky. You know, I, I don't think so, but <laughs> um, uh, you really want to, um, you know, look at it, you know, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off and you say, um, you know, all the knowledge I've gained, what's next? Um, what advice would you give to those who want to start a robotics company? Well, one piece of advice uh, to this audience is doing it while you're young can be really rewarding. Um, Colin and I started iRobot right out of grad school. Rod, as the business partner, was a bit older and he had a professorship already, but he kept his day job at MIT. Um, if you do it before you have mortgages, kids, you know, responsibilities, um, you know, we just kept living like grad students for the next five years. Um, but we hadn't established that um, you know, standard of living yet. Um, so you know, even if you have these things, you should do it anyway, um, but you have to make sure that you're also fulfilling those other obligations, which can make it a little bit tougher even. Um, but the most important thing, of course, as, as I said, is make sure what you're designing truly addresses your customer need. Um, what advice do you give to young students on what to study like today? Well, um, I actually get a really good basic degree in either engineering, physics, mathematics, um, but what you take on on the on the side, um, something that's a little far out, right? <laughs> you know, maybe it's biological robots, maybe it's deep space robots, maybe, you know, it's something that people might not believe yet today, but 10 years from now, with your help potentially, that might be the next big thing and put you in a really great position as one of the leaders in the field. Um, oh, a question from the audience. What was the name of the toy and what did it do? I'm sorry? Uh, what was the name of the toy and what did it do? The one that people said looked like Chucky, I believe? Oh, uh, the toy was called My Real Baby. <laughs> and, um, you know, it had an emotive engine and we, um, you know, but as I said, when we were first designing it, we designed it for, you know, a few hundred dollars and you know when we took it to the toy company they laughed because we needed a cost of goods that was really really low to get to the point where it could be sold for under a hundred dollars which is what toys usually run for i still have mine i love her <laughs> <laughs> um 
Um, I think it would have been, I think, I think it's a lovely toy. I haven't seen it, but I think it's a good toy <laughs> from hearing about it. Um, what's the coolest robot you ever built? Yeah, that's, um, that's kind of tough, right? Um, that's like asking a mom to pick between her children. Um, and, you know, they're all good and they're all cool in different ways. <laughs> um, Roomba has really defined the home robot category, and it's, it's now 20% of the vacuuming market in the United States. And there's 20 million of out there. 20 million of them out there, so that's really, really cool. Um, Packbot is credited with saving the lives of thousands of civilians and hundreds of soldiers. Um, it's in this Space Hall of Fame and in the Smithsonian. And the drones are built at Sci-Fi Works. They were also out uh, saving lives uh, by gathering information first. And um, uh, we did the first field trials uh, with UPS on drone delivery right here in Massachusetts, going from Beverly to Children's Island, uh, which is three miles off the off the coast. So that was really uh, cool too, delivering uh, an admin here in case a kid needed it at a, at a summer camp. So uh, please don't make me choose. <laughs> um, I have a question. So what do you think was the hardest robot to build? The hardest robot? They're all really hard. And I like to say, well, if it was easy, someone would have done it. Uh, because complexity, you know, whenever you add something new, the complexity goes up. And robotics really combines computers, mechanical systems, dynamic sensing, um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and to have all these running at the same time and get them all right, um, one thing I've said is, um, Amateurs concentrate on design. Professionals uh, talk about um, system integration, thermal, and noise. And you'll be surprised how hard it is to get a system to come together at the price point at a manufacturable um, in in a manufacturable design. Um, another question from the audience is: What industry do you think will be most impacted by robots? What industry? Yes. Um, let's see. Oh, that's a that, that that's a tough one. Um, I think all physical industries are impacted by robotic technology. Um, I really haven't been able to think of one that isn't. Um, right now, industries are begging for robots because of the coronavirus, just to keep physical space between people, because there's still things that have to. Um, uh, have to be transported between them. Um, so there's um, many, many places where uh, robots will make an impact, but I think that um, right now, because of the, the current need, uh, the coronavirus impact. Um, wow, this is a good one. Uh, what type of robot have you wanted to always build but have not been able to? Oh, I built so many. <laughs> I, I built uh, ground, air, and uh, even some underwater robots, um, uh, sea gliders that go in the ocean for six months at a time. Um, I've been involved in building them, I should say, because there's a team of, robot, of, of roboticists that work on every single one of them. Um, and um, let's see, what haven't I built yet? Um, oh, there's so, there's, there's, I, I, although I, maybe a, a robot for space, we did some work on it early in iRobot, um, but we never got into space. We did test flights at Edwards Air Force Base, but we never really got it into a, a launch. I mean, we were maybe 20 years ahead of our time, maybe 30. <laughs> uh, what was this, uh, if you had finished this robot, what would it have been used for? I'm sorry? This space robot, like, what would you have used it for? Like, what was uh, its job? Oh, um, well, I think uh, collecting a sample return from another planet and bringing it back would be one of the uh, things that hasn't been done yet by humans. And I think uh, sending a robot first to do that would would be a wonderful use. Cool. Given your position as advisor to the Army, how is the government looking at using robots? Oh, well, there's uh, so many. The planned modernization system, um, uh, 
the pan modernization of the army contains uh, all the elements have robotic components. So you've got on the air vehicle side, you've got replacements for the Comanche and the Chinook. Um, so big, big UAVs and then little ones that fit in your pocket that you take out and send into dangerous situations. Uh, on, on the ground, they're actually still using ones that are a little bit smaller than the ones we built at iRobot. Um, but still the same concept, go out and dispose of uh, bombs, get a look into buildings first. And then on the larger size, robot combat vehicle um, to become an advanced robotic line, um, all under control of a soldier operating it. Um, Today is actually my very last day with the Army, though, after a two-year spell in the, uh, in, in the Pentagon, um, being an advisor for robotic technology. And it was a wonderful experience. And if anyone ever gets an opportunity to uh, do some work uh, for the government, I, I highly recommend it. Um, I, I got a thrill every single time I walked into the Pentagon. It's very interesting. Um, could you elaborate on your time there? Because that sounds actually very nice and fun. I'm sorry, elaborate on what? On your time with uh, the Pentagon. Like, well, like describe your experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, well, there are a, a lot of different programs and there's a lot of coordination that needs to be done between programs. And given my experience, like there's a lot of people that have um, dealt with robotic technology, but where I really come in is building robot products and getting them deployed. And so uh, giving advice on the programs in that context, like how do you get it from an idea to deployment? Um, another question from the audience. What are you going to do next? Um, I, well, this is my last day, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make a plan. I, I believe strongly you take on one thing and you do it with your whole heart before you pursue the next thing. But I will be doing something else. Ooh. Uh, next for like, if you were planning on doing next projects, what would you think you would, uh, how, I'm sorry, <laughs> what do you think you would do? Like, what do you, what would you want to pursue? Um, something with a large impact, something that's scalable, that can have a large impact, um, because I'm, you know, I think I'm in a unique position, having had some successes and, um, and some hard-earned, deep knowledge of the robot field. Um, another question from the audience. You mentioned that robots can help with COVID. What do you see them doing to help? Well, they can work on... Um, in, in, in many areas, they can work on um, safety, security. Um, they can be used to uh, get samples to the right place quickly. Like if you have a swab and you want to get it uh, to a place that can analyze it. Um, and also delivering supplies they've been used for. Um, you know, the ferries are out. There's places in the world that are not accessible uh, in any other way. So having a drone make those deliveries is one um, I think, uh, effective way. Um, seeing how we're so like technically advanced in this day and age, do you think after COVID-19 we will make, or robots will be made um, in with the foresight that something like this could happen again? I think that there are uh, a lot of people working in that direction to automate the supply chain so it keeps up and running, so people get food on their tables. Um, people working on sanitizing robots so uh, hospitals can continue to uh, operate so you're not putting uh, you know humans exposed to um, pathogens um, so I, I I really think that it you know I'm, I'm so obviously it's it's terrible it took a, a crisis like this but I think there are a lot of people looking at um, robots that can help these situations. And one I just heard about was a teleoperated robot, just so you can go to a patient who's in critical, critical care um, uh, because they, they won't let the families in. I mean, maybe hopefully one day we'll be able to do that, but have them be able to um, communicate to them through a webcam and be able to move it around because the, um, the person in critical care can't do it. And the nurses are overwhelmed with other demands on their, their time, other patients. Okay, uh, another audience question. You said something about a drone flying out to an island. When do you think mm -hmm. we will see drone delivery to our homes? Well, 
I'm a, uh, a large advocate for um, drone delivery. Um, when is a good question. Um, it's really, I don't think it's as much a technological challenge right now as a, a cultural a regulation and, you know, getting all your ducks in a row and making sure the communities are on board with it. Um, it but it's being used right now to attack applications where there is no other way to do things or the other way is so cost prohibitive that it doesn't get done. Um, about drones, do you think uh, there's anyone like opposed to drones and like, why do you, what are the reasons why someone would be opposed to drones, do you think? Well, I've heard a, a lot, well, what if these robots, you know, if they're doing deliveries, um, there's a lot of deliveries, so they'll come, they'll block out the sun and there'll be a swarm of drones coming in. Uh, I don't think that's ever realistically going to happen because, you know, the a, a truck is the most efficient way to get things if there's a large number of deliveries on one street. But if you want something quickly, a drone is highly efficient. Um. How do you suggest starting a career in technology for the military? For the starting a career in technology for the military. For the military? Well, it depends which side you want to be on. If you want to be in the military, well, you, you can easily sign up. <laughs> um, if you want to work at one of the wonderful research labs that we have, um, they're always looking for the for the best and brightest, and it's a great career. Um, it's a great career path um, where you get to work on some of the most cutting edge technology in the whole world. Um, or you could be a contractor and design something, build a company, and the government has programs where you can get funding for your idea. Um, and there's many of them, and I'll be happy to talk to individuals about them. If you connect to me on LinkedIn and say you saw me on Mass Robotics, uh, I'll be happy to talk about it in more in depth. Um, where do you think robots in general are headed and what kind of impact do you think robots will have in the future and where do you think they'll play the biggest role? Well, I think it's uh, it's going to be drone delivery as we've uh, discussed a little bit, but, you know, you place an order, it, uh, it comes to, from your local fulfillment center, which itself runs robotically. It gets all, you know, the... The, the thing you ordered is taken to the roof by other other robots, put on a drone. Uh, you know, the shortest distance between any two points is as the drone flies. So it takes it in, right to your house or a landing pad, maybe on the top of your apartment building, and bam, instant stuff. It's really exciting. There's a lot of talk about humanoids. Do you see a place for those? What do you think they'll do? Um, I never say never because um, I, I never say never because as technology advances, there might be different uh, equations. But I'm not a believer in humanoids because I think that uh, specific robots doing a specific application is how um, we've had success. Like you know, Roomba's form factor makes it so it goes under couches and under beds, which the traditional way of doing vacuuming, it, you, you don't really get that. So it does more sometimes than the uh, than the person doing the job. There are, you know, billions of people in the world and they're all really, really, really good. <laughs> so to have to build something that competes with their intelligence is very difficult. But if we can do the kinds of things that humans can't do or it puts them in danger or it takes too much of their time, I think that's a really good place for the robots to play a part. Um, question from the audience. What technology leap needs to happen for robots to get out there more widely? Okay, so we're not talking saying 20 million Roombas is that wide enough yet. So, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, all the all the hobby drones are, are robots too, fly, you know, small flying robots, and they're getting more and more intelligent. Um, I think there's a lot of tasks that are just difficult, right? Like. Uh, I, I want a robot that cleans my windows, and I don't have one yet. <laughs> um, but it's it's really difficult, you know, with all the paints and sticking onto the walls. I mean, sticking onto the paint, uh, to the to the glass, etc. It's it's very very 
a hard job. So as technology develops and we come across something, uh, once we worked on how geckos stick to walls, so maybe the gecko feet will come one day and be able to take on the glass cleaning. Um, what role do you think technology will play in biology in the future or vice versa? In biology? Well, robots are being used um, a lot already in, in biology in, um, you know, when you do DNA sequencing, when you, um, you, you know, when you collect samples, when you move things around. Um, I think it really has come on strong, especially with, you know, in the current crisis. And, um, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, some designs for little robots that you eat as pills and then can do something specific inside your body and then come right out. You know, I, I just think um, if I was going into uh, robotics now, I think combining it with the biological systems might be a really uh, interesting area to explore. Um, question from the audience. Roomba is a great success in the home, but it seems to be like the only big one. Why is it hard to do home robots? That is a really good question. Uh, someone at iRobot once said, the floor is the ghetto. <laughs> you know, it's hard to break out of. I, I think um, because the market is large and um, everybody has a floor, not everyone has a swimming pool. Um, not everyone even has a lawn. So the grass cutter robot and the swimming pool cleaning robots haven't been as popular. Um, I think, but there's, you know, there's a, quite a few jobs you, you need to find a job where there's enough in common that you can design a mechanical and computer station system around it. And as the jobs get too complex, uh, it's really only a human that can still do them. So in part, you would say um, the reason why there aren't, there aren't a lot of home robots is because of the coding and also like the convenience? Because they're tough to to me, like, look at, you know, what, what do people spend a lot of time on? Taking the dishes off the table. And even though we only put them in our dishwashing robots today, <laughs> um, you still have to get them there. That's a very difficult job. And if someone attacks it just like a human would, I think I will never say never, but it's going to take a long time coming. But if you can somehow change the way it's done, um, that might be a way that we can get there to make it a more robot friendly task. Uh, another from the audience. There seems to be a lot of growing robot companies in the state. Which ones do you think I should look for at? Look at for a job. <laughs> um, I think if you end up at any robot company, you're going to be in a, a good place. You know, you get to have that design experience, um, learn how a small company operates, and you might decide once you have that experience, maybe you're going to be the one that starts the next company in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes a company most successful? That product market fit, getting something that's affordable, manufacturable, and really makes the customer happy. Um, and that's a really tough challenge. Um, I'm inclined to ask. So what do you think, like what material do you think is like the hardest to avoid? If that makes what, sense. What material? Because like uh, there's like a lot of expensive materials and a difficult uh, thing is to find substitutes. So what well, material do you think is like a must have? It really depends on the market. If you have a robotic toy, you can be up to like about a hundred dollars, maybe a little more now. Um, if you have a appliance, a few hundred dollars, up to about a thousand dollars. If you're building a robot. Um, for industry, it might be a few thousand dollars. If you're building a robot for the military, it might be hundreds of thousand dollars. And some of the larger robots are even a few million dollars. So you really can't make a generic statement. You really have to look at the market that you're attacking with it. Um, and for someone going into a company for a job, what do you think is like the best way to really like what do you think is most important in a worker for like these uh, robot companies? Oh, to, to, you know, I've hired a lot of people and the most important thing to me is that they've built robots um, as, a, as a hobby, as a club, 
but have that hands-on experience. Um, um, haven't done ev everything just on a computer where, you know, you you might it might take some debugging, but it's not the same as, you know, having to deal with real hardware, software interaction. So people that have built something on their own, um, not part of just a school curriculum. I, I, I really look for that because that usually says that they're a builder. Um, and I know you took a lot of majors um, or you took a lot of classes um, surrounding technology. What do you think is the hardest thing that you personally learned? Oh, the hardest thing. Um, I mean, for me personally, it was um, fluid dynamics. <laughs> I, I always found that a, a challenge. Um, I think if you're talking about just you know, relevant to my robot career. Um, it's a it's it's a good question. I think one of the biggest things is modularity. Like even at the expense of design elegance, uh, making things modular so you can take apart the components. When people had a Roomba break once upon a time, they had to send it back. Now, if it's a wheel module, they can take off a wheel module. You know, there are different discrete components that uh, come together. And if you can have that, it saves on manufacturing costs, it saves on um, debugging and testing, but it also saves in all the aftermarket. Uh, you know, it, it affects almost everything if you can build modular components and put them together. And even if it has to make a little bit of a not as efficient design, a modular design um, is usually better for all those reasons. Okay. Um, so you say, um, well, the thing is when you're usually making something, there's a lot of like drafts and like trials, right? I'm sorry? When you create something, there's usually a lot of drafts and then a lot of trials right. of those right. things you have created. What do you think out of everything you made had the most trials? Ooh, um, well, I, I, there's two different answers whether you're talking about getting to market or whether it's, um, well, whether you're talking about um, the multiple generations, because Roomba is on, you know, I think it's generation 10 or something now, right? So after all those generations, it does a lot more than it did at the beginning. But if we tried to get all that into it at the beginning, we would have failed. Right. It takes multiple generations to build up capabilities, including right now the full navigation system that they put on it. Um, but we got into the market really, really quickly, um, you know, within three years from when we started working on it. Um, the robots that takes, you know, maybe the longest to get to market was probably um, uh, robots that I built uh, drones because you had that added uh, added being in the sky. So if you have a failure, <laughs> so we did a lot more simulations in that. So we test things out a lot more before you turn them on, but having that added component of being in the sky. So if something goes wrong, you know, there's a safety, but also um, you can destroy the system. I think that takes a little bit longer. Well, we're running out of time here. Uh, we're trying to keep these to 45 minutes and this has been great because it's been nonstop questions, which I like. Um, I do want to uh, thank both of you for uh, for joining us here this afternoon. Um, and uh, just, uh, I know that uh, Elizabeth, you did a drone camp with us last year, um, and we're gonna be offering that again to Boston Public School students. Um, so if you're interested in potentially uh, joining the, the drone camp, it's uh, sponsored by Amazon Robotics, um, and we'll be, uh, we'll be taking uh, applications for that uh, you can send email to info at massrobotics.org. Um, I won't put Elizabeth on the spot for her uh, experience with the drone camp. Uh, hopefully she enjoyed it, uh, but I do think it's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, just a, a special thanks to uh, Mass Tech Collaborative who helped organize this, uh, this webinar. Um, and they're really doing some interesting research into the uh, ecosystem of robotics companies here in Massachusetts. And if you'd like to learn more, um, you can go to their website, which is um, www.masstech.org slash robotics. And there you can learn all about the great robotics industry that we have here. Again, thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Helen. 
And we look forward to seeing you next week when we're going to be chatting with Mark Rayburn, the CEO of Boston Dynamics. Thank you, everyone. A robot is an extension of human capability. It feels like the future. It's very exciting. You will see everything from drones to self-driving vehicles, walking robots, and we're excited that it's being developed here in Massachusetts. We have the breadth of talent, the investor community. We have the facilities to design it, fabricate it, test. It's just a great environment for robotics.